So I want to first of all set out the case for change which we articulate in the report. Um, we want public services to do two things. Um, we want them to help us tackle the big challenges we face as a country and we also want them to provide a high quality service um, to their users. And our argument in this paper is that um, as currently configured our public services are doing neither of these things uh, as well as they ought to. There have basically been two ways of organising and running public services which have been dominant over the last 30 years. The first is top-down um, control, um, and you'll have heard a lot about how bad top-down control is in the last few days, um, running things from Whitehall, setting lots of targets for people at the front line to follow. And the other way is um, efficiently whizzing in um, from the side the head the private sector and bringing in competition um, in order to get uh, contestability and, and sort of push people to up their game. Um, we argue in the paper that bureaucracy and markets do have their place and are important in the uh, sort of way public services are run, um, but they're particularly good at tackling certain types of problems, and these are problems which in the paper we, we call tame problems. Um, so a tame problem is like hospital waiting times, um, where we've um, been quite successful at setting targets and reducing hospital waits. Or a tame problem is like um, collecting the bins efficiently, which um, local authorities now do um, very efficiently, very effectively, and at lower cost than they used to, and possibly the use of contestability in that area is one of the uh, reasons for that. Now, tame problems basically have a small number of causes. Um, those causes um, interact with one another in relatively predictable ways, um, and um, they, these, these problems can be dealt with within service silos as a result of those two things. The problem is that there's a growing number of what we call in the paper complex problems. These include long-term unemployment, um, youth offending, antisocial behaviour, um, chronic disease, uh, mental illness. And bureaucracy and markets are less effective at tackling these uh, kind of problems. Um, and that's because complex problems have multiple causes that are interconnected and that interact in unpredictable ways. So because of that unpredictability, um, it's very hard for bureaucratic standardised approaches um, to work. So take, for example, antisocial behaviour. If you go onto an estate which has a problem with antisocial behaviour, how do you tackle it? There's no one single blueprint for tackling antisocial behaviour in the same way that there is a single blueprint for bringing down hospital weights. Um, also, you can't deal with antisocial behaviour just within one public service in the way you can deal with hospital weights in, in, within, the, within the realms of the NHS. Um, you actually have to bring together lots of different services to deal with it. Long-term employment, particularly for those um, who are sick and, and disabled, um, is a particular problem here. And this is where I introduce Steve. Uh, Steve um, is, is a person who, and the names have been changed, but is a person who, who I know from my work as a local councillor. And Steve has been on incapacity benefit for well over a decade. He um, has... Um, uh, he has a, a, an intermittent uh, chronic condition which uh, makes it hard for him to work. He has, I think it's fair to say, sort of anger management issues. He tends to get quite um, pent up when he's dealing with all the agencies he has to deal with, particularly the Department of Work, work and Pensions. Um, and um, and he, he was in prison um, for a number of years. Now, every time I run into this guy, he, um, he always says, oh, I went to another, I went to another interview, I, you know, and, and I said, well, how did it go? Um, unsuccessfully. You know, I've known this guy for five years. Um, he's uh, never been able to find a job despite uh, the trying. He finds it a little unjust that because I'm a local councillor and I work here, I have two jobs but he can't get one. Um, and the argument we make in the paper is that for people like Steve with very, com with very complex personal circumstances, um, the current um, bureaucratic ways of trying to get um, him into work aren't, aren't working. So we know that the work program, um, while it's had more success with people um, on JSA, it has, been, has had very little success with people with these kind of very complex um, cases. And I think that's because you're, trying, you're simply contracting out a silo of the government um, to the private sector and holding it to account for trying to get people into work um, when in fact you need a lot. You need to deal with all of the issues that are going on in someone's lives, and it's very difficult to do that in a silo. Um, so, 
the argument then that I've made so far is that public services are not configured to tackle a growing range of complex problems. And the second part of our case for change is that public services are not providing users with the kind of service they want. And we spoke to um, a range of women using different uh, public services, um, using earlier services, maternity services, um, helping their relatives um, access um, social care services. And we found that the overwhelming thing that came out is that often when they wanted a relationship um, in, the, in, in the way public services were provided, they got a perfunctory transaction. Now, that's not to say there aren't public services where what you want is a transaction, like paying your parking permits or uh, paying your council tax, um, where you just want an efficient exchange in and out. Um, but there are other services where the relationship is crucial. So take these quotes from the report. This is in relation to home care. Um, and this is one woman who said they treat them like they're animals. There's no communication. They just strip them and wash them and don't even talk. There's no dignity. Can you imagine being disabled and having a stranger in to wash you and the next day having a different stranger and the next day another one? And it might even be a man. Can you imagine how you'd feel? You'd want to see the same person every day. The agencies humiliate them and take their life away from them. Um, now, that was not an isolated quote. There were some quite horrifying stories that people told us about the um, kind of home care provision they get. Now, there's lots of reason why many of those services struggle to provide people with what they want, but it's very clear that the inconsistency of the relationships and the very perfunctory nature of the exchanges which go on um, is, is a key part of the problem. Um, but it's not just about the relationships between the user and the service provider, it's also about relationships, our relationships with each other, which is another key aspect of this. So one woman said that when she came home from hospital, I went home with my baby, I didn't know what I was doing, I ended up phoning up the NHS because I couldn't get him to stop crying. It sounds silly now, but at the time it was really scary. And actually what she said she wanted was to be, to have, to be able to talk to other mothers in exactly the same position so that she could, um, uh, you know, find out um, what was going on and, and reassure herself and so on. So finding ways of bringing people together to tackle shared problems is key. So the key element here is about shifting, trying to provide deeper relationships, not shallow transactions. And what people asked for was con more consistency of personnel, stronger interpersonal skills, a single point of contact for advice and support, and access to peer support so that people can work with one another. So. Um, the second part of what I'm going to say is how do we move um, from where we are now to um, this sort of brave new world. Um, there are two big reform moves which characterize the shift to what we call the relational state. And I should say the relational state for us is not a sort of destination, uh, sort of utopia that we've sort of where we've penciled in all the blanks. It's more a direction of travel um, and it's, a, it's an instinct about where public services need to go. And the two big reform moves are what we call in the report connect and, and deepen. So first of all, at the, at the level of the system, the public, uh, the relational state is, a, is about a, a more connected uh, system and public services which are more connected together. Um, this, means in, uh, this means devolving longer term budgets down to the local level. It means allowing local areas to pool funding across the different service silos that exist so they can take a rounded, holistic view of the complex problems that I described. It is about sometimes integrating those services well. I mean, one service which we highlight in the report that's done really well is um, the youth offending teams, which have had a big, big success in reducing the number of young people coming into the criminal justice system and going into custody. And they have a model of having mixed professionals all working together in the same uh, team, which uh, can take a holistic view of uh, a young offender's problems. Um, greater autonomy for the front line. I mean, this is where politicians get a bit nervous because this is about letting go, letting people innovate and experiment, form relationships as they find them. Um, but we're very, we're very clear that that has to be accompanied by clear accountability for the outcomes achieved, and we talk more about that in the, in the report. And also collaborative infrastructures so the system can learn. So rather than the central government bossing people around and telling them what to do so much, this is about central government, um, if you like, being a kind of clearinghouse for innovation. And again, if you look at the youth justice system, the youth justice board has, has been doing that very well, which is let people try things out in local areas and then bring together the evidence and pass it around and show people what works so they can learn from each other. So that's the connected system. At the level of the individual and the community, what this is about is deep relationships, not shallow transactions. And there, there are two aspects of this. One is this relationship between the citizen and the professional. And here we argue for um, in areas where people want a strong relationship, that they have consistent relationships, so key workers allocated to particular individuals, which does happen in some places but not in all. More neighbourhood-based working so that um, 
social workers, for example, um, can get to know their, their local patch and develop relationships with, with local people. But also stronger, deeper citizen-to-citizen -citizen relationships as well, which means designing institutions that bring people together. Um, and of course, many of these institutions already exist, and um, they're all out there doing um, fantastic work, and we highlight a lot of that in the report. But we think um, local authorities and national government need to be more systematic about promoting those kind of uh, institutions. What are the challenges with this before I finish? Um, the first challenge is, is politics, um, because our political system, all the incentives are for national politicians to, um, to act, to do, um, to show that they're responding to uh, what's in the media and, and so on. And we're arguing for um, them to sit back and let other people um, take the lead, um, to set out what they want people to achieve, but not necessarily how they achieve it. Um, and this is a big challenge, and we struggle with that in, in, in a country which has such a centralised political culture as ours. And we talk more about it in the report, but the, the reason I'm more optimistic than ever about this, and of course people say, well, oppositions always talk about localism, but when they get into government, it, you know, that all falls away. And there's, I'm sure there'll be lots of scepticism in, in, in the room around this. But the reason I am optimistic about it is that everybody recognises that the fiscal position is dire. And but actually, in all parties and across Whitehall, people are looking seriously now at how you push fund down so that you can make more sense of it, so that you can um, allocate pool budgets to local areas that can bring money forward to prevent problems from happening in the first place. It's a more rational way of saving money than simply salami slicing government departments. So that's my reason for optimism. Um, on, and the money, now you, some people might say, well, deep relationships, you know, one needs to cost more money. Um, and our argument here is that, of course, not in, not in all areas do you want a deep relationship, and in fact, there's plenty of scope in services which are inherently transactional um, to automate them and to reduce um, the, the headcount and reduce staff numbers and so on in some of those services. And we, we have some examples of that in the, in, in the report. Um, so on the transactional side, we think we need to automate much more and um, be much more efficient there in order that we can sustain um, the more relational side, which is inherently quite labor intensive. Um, but we also think, as I've said, if you push the budget down and give people long ter longer term planning horizons, they can bring money forward in order to save money. And if you look at John Credis' speech which he gave today, he has a lot of examples of how that's actually happening on the ground in terms of um, uh, local authorities actually saving, uh, saving real money. Um, and fi the final challenge is, are, are we up for it, as in, are, are, is the public up for it? Because actually this involves the citizen um, having more power but also more responsibility and ste stepping forward to take part. And of course we're all slightly haunted by the failure of the big society. Um, and I think the problem with the big society um, was that it was very much about withdrawing the state and expecting that spontaneously a thousand flowers would bloom. And we actually argue that actually government does have a role in promoting um, the kind of civic activity that we want to see. So one great example in the report which we found was a neighbourhood justice panel which has been set up in Swindon, set up by um, the, uh, the Police and Crime Commission, the local authority, um, but involving giving local people a space in which they can um, essentially low-level crimes are referred to this panel uh, of local residents who, um, uh, and this avoids um, many of those um, issues getting sucked up into the very expensive criminal justice system. So that's an example of, of local government actually quite deliberately creating an institution which activates the kind of voluntary activity that we want to see. And we think we need to be, uh, there is a role for government in that. So, um, uh, of course, there were challenges with this when change is um, meaningful, there will always be obstacles and barriers, but I think the prize from this shift to a more relational state will be great, it will mean a renewed role for government, um, uh, public services which can better meet the big challenges that we face as a society, and um, I think more uh, connected and empowered citizens as well. Thank you very much. Me again. Thanks Rick. Um, Yes, you, you very self-deprecatingly said you weren't describing a, a utopia there, although I have to admit, if we could get public services that work like that, that sounds pretty utopian <laughs> to me, I'd be happy for one. Um, you also illuminated at the end there some of the, the, the real challenges ahead. Um, uh, ideally, I suppose what we would have now is um, a politician who could respond to that, <laughs> someone thoughtful, intelligent, uh, who understands public policy <laughs> research, maybe knows a little bit about IPPR, uh, thoughtful. One of the kind of more impressive people in the God. shadow cabinet at the start of the 2010 intake of Labour MPs. Um, oh, and we do, we have here Liz Kendall, Shadow Minister for Social 
care and older people um, follow that list. Oh You're gosh, uh, well. I'm going to I'm going to speak from here. Is that is this uh, doodah working? Yeah, is it? Um, it is. Can I just say it's always lovely to come to IPPR. I've worked here, I think, three times on separate occasions in my in my uh, so-called career. So it's very nice to be back here today, and I'm really grateful to Rick for inviting me and to all of you for coming today through the yucky, awful weather, but thankfully not a tube strike, so welcome. Um, I'm going to, forgive me for being a politician, but I want to say something a bit about the political context, I think, before I move on to the kind of policy uh, issues and challenges. Um, Raphael said, uh, he's just come from Westminster where actually a lot of people don't really talk about public service reform and this is going to seem so strange to all of you who work on these issues day in day out but whilst there has been a huge political debate um, and debate in the media uh, since the um, uh, credit crunch about how we need to change our economy there has been really relatively little debate about the equally important issue of how we change the role of government and the state. And that may seem not right to you because you are all intensely engaged with these issues, but on the political stage I think this issue hasn't had anywhere near so much attention as, as it should have done. So, um, uh, to clarify, you know, this is about Westminster. I, I have seen actually a really vibrant and exciting debate, not just at IPPR, but Nesta, the New Economic Foundation, the RSA, Demos, local councils who are actually having to try and make these changes on the ground, and all of the people here who work in the voluntary and community sector who are really grappling with these issues because you're at the front end of it, representing and working with people who use public services. So not for the first time, Westminster is playing a bit of catch up here. Um, but I think this debate about the future of our public services is absolutely essentially is the thing I feel most passionately about and we've got to face it for three reasons. Firstly, because people want and need different types of services and support. Uh, the IPPR report sets that very well and as a constituency MP every week in my surgeries I am meeting people who are fed up with some of our local public services. They feel they have to battle between different parts of the system, telling their story time and time over again. They feel they're shoehorned to fit into a service that doesn't understand their lives. They don't get that kind of upfront help and support. They end up in crisis moments, stuck in a, in a vicious circle. So I know from my constituents that this is, this is what my constituency surgeries um, are full of. And those pressures are only going to increase in future with our aging population, which presents huge challenges to our public services, but also because I think, um, actually for once, my phone is in my, in my bag, I can hear it beeping away. I do think technology and the way that we are all, as you know, ordinary people, interacting with services using our phones and technology is really going to transform services in future and the, the public services have to keep pace with that, with that change. The second reason we've got to face up to this, as I think Rick talked about, is the brutal fiscal challenge facing whichever government is elected in 2015. I think the IFS said last week that despite uh, many of the problems I certainly see as a constituency MP and in my role as Shadow Minister for Care and Older People about the uh, cuts that have been made, the IFS says only 40% of the actual the cuts have actually been delivered so far and uh, any government that wants to uh, eliminate the deficit and get a budget surplus over the course of the next parliament is going to face phenomenally difficult decisions and that makes it even more important than ever before that we get 
the most that we can out of every pound of public uh, spending. But thirdly, I would say we, we can't build the new economy unless we also build a new state. I see the two as being inextricably linked. If we're going to get young people in my constituency having the skills they need to get a good job so that the country as a whole can compete on the global stage, we're going to have to look at big changes, particularly in our early years services, because kids are falling behind before they've barely begun. And if you look at the other end of the life cycle, we are going to have to help people stay fit and healthier for longer as we live for longer so they can work and care for longer uh, if our public finances are going to be sustainable. So public services are absolutely uh, essential and we need big changes to make that happen and I believe that um, on the centre-left we have a particular responsibility to face up to these issues. I think Bill Clinton said in the 1990s it's people who believe in the power and the good that government can do have a particular responsibility to reinvent government to make sure it works for the people uh, we want to serve. Now I think that the IPPR report um, is absolutely spot on in identifying the challenges, the need to shift the focus of services towards prevention and early intervention which is better for people and makes better use of public money, the need to join up services and support, silos are a uh, luxury we can no longer afford uh, even if we ever could and thirdly this need to build much better, fuller, richer relationships between the people who use services and the staff and between um, individuals, families and within their communities. Uh, one really powerful example of this, I'm saying this because Alex is sitting here, I met a phenomenal group of parents uh, involved in something called Partners in Policy Making, but essentially what it was is uh, parents who have children with quite profound uh, learning and physical disabilities who had battled the system before and not got what they wanted, who came together, organised by themselves, to find out about what is the world leading best practice in care for people uh, with disabilities, for children with disabilities. And one mum told me about her daughter, who she was told by a professional would need quite severe operations and a long period in institutional care. But through this group of people who got in touch with experts, she found out about how what's called postural care, which is body alignment, could help improve her daughter's life. She ended up not needing any of those operations, not having to go and stay far away, but staying at home, fit and healthy, better for them and better for the taxpayer. But she said it was only by coming together with others that she found out about what could happen to improve their lives. Now, I want to say a couple of points where I would go further than uh, the IPPR uh, report uh, um, firstly is, I mean, Rick, you're absolutely right about giving power away down to councils uh, and, and also at the regional level and down to communities. We can't do it, we cannot micromanage from Whitehall uh, and I'll come on to part of that problem in a, in a minute too. But it's, I think the power has also got to go down to individuals as well because the people who know best how to join up their services and support are people because they don't see their needs, we don't see our needs through the prism of separate silos. The people who know best how to shift the focus to prevention are the people who use services because they're the ones who suffer the crisis and the problems if they don't get the upfront help and support early on. And I have been a long-standing and passionate supporter of personal budgets. I don't think they're right for everybody in every circumstance and it's got to be about a real choice if people want to have it but where they have been done well with the right help and support they have transformed people's lives and I think the, the next stage in personal budgets is not just looking how we join them up in, in social care and health care and mental health too but is really how we get people on those personal budgets to come together to really drive changes in the services that are available. I've seen many of my constituents who've been had much more power through this personal budget, but they say the services I want aren't really out there. Um, and so places like Lambeth are now bringing people with personal budgets together to look at what services are on offer and the council then acts as a broker either changing existing services or bringing in new providers. I think that's a powerful model for the future because giving people that, that real power over what services they get is vital. 
And the second point where I, I think I would go further than IPPR is um, it is very hard to do all of this locally if central government continues to function in the same way. You know, central government says to local government and local services, pull your budgets, stop all the duplication, um, and yet we still have our separate government departments who rarely work together, uh, who have separate budgets and, and hold people to account through these separate streams. And I think we've got to change that. So is there is a big question about the future of central government too. I hope that's something that IPPR may come on to in future. But unless you change how you work centrally, unless you give people real power and control as individuals as well as communities, we're never going to get the changes we need because bureaucracies do fight against change. You've got to have really powerful levers to make the change happen. So this is a brilliant starting point and I hope we can go further. Thanks. Um, thanks, Liz, since you've set the precedent of speaking from, the, from a sedentary position, as I think we say, in the House. Uh, I won't wander over there. Uh, I will introduce um, Alex Fox, Chief Executive of Shared Lives Plus. Um, I would explain what he does, but I'm very, very confident he'll do that a lot better than I will. So over yeah. to you, Alex. And I will go up there because I was hidden around the corner a bit there. So um, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, for, for people that haven't come across um, Shared Lives and, and what we get up to, um, it's a deeply relational approach to um, supporting adults. So. Um, if you were recruited and trained and approved as a shared life carer by your local scheme, and you almost certainly have one, uh, you'd be matched with an adult who needs support. So thank you. Somebody uh, with dementia might become a regular visitor at your household rather than visiting a day centre, or someone with a learning disability or a mental health problem uh, might move in with you and live as part of your family, either for a short period while they're getting back on their feet and putting down some roots in the community or sometimes for a long period and some people have been living together for 35 years or so. Um, it's used by about 10,000 people already and we're aiming to double that. Um, so like Liz, you, you're not going to hear me disagree with, with, the, with the messages in this report but um, again like Liz, um, uh, I've got some quite similar messages um, around the need to take this idea of connect and deepen um, a bit further. Um, and to do that, I'd, I'd also like to, uh, to say something about uh, personal budgets um, and to take a little detour into the lessons that we can learn from implementing personal budgets um, in social care. Um, and so I think people in this room are probably familiar with, with how personal budgets work and the fact that uh, for, for some people they're able to take their personal, they decide to take their personal budgets as a cash direct payment. Um, which individuals are then free to, to, to spend, in theory, on, on the support package of their choice. So for that, that rel still relatively small group of people who use direct payments, um, they've been able to, com to exert, in some cases, complete control, complete individual control over their personal support. And for some people, this has been life-changing. Um, so we've seen people who've become employees of their own support staff and people spending uh, their individual allocations on things as far removed from traditional social care as membership uh, of leisure clubs and um, in the case of one small group of people with learning disabilities which we support um, creating their own dance activities business. Um, so these are things which are which don't look a lot like services and which are kind of uncategorizable and therefore not things that you could commission for even at that very local level. Um, but actually um, what they all have in common is that they are about people um, aiming for and achieving some actually very familiar goals which we probably all share. Um, goals like friendship, um, belonging and the chance to contribute. On the other hand, um, a, a much larger group of people um, have needed or wanted more state support to spend their personal budget allocation. And many of them have found that much less has, has changed. So despite the promise of choice and control, actually people are often finding that they're spending their money on, on roughly the same group of providers doing the same old things. And of course in the current climate of cuts, uh, often doing less of the same rather than more of the same. Uh, and in some areas those cuts have been made in the name of, uh, of, of independence and uh, independent living and, um, and, and transition and modernization. So I think I, it's ironic that um, 
some on the left are now blaming what they see as the individualization of personal budgets for a fragmentation of services or for, for cuts in, in essential support, when actually, in reality, I think you could argue that the, the, the problem has been uh, the lack of individual control. Um, for many people who've needed that extra support, we've seen the state step in to help organize with its standardizing tendencies and its innate, in some cases, mistrust of individuals and it's mixed up a pretty um, turgid brew of kind of quasi free markets um, with old fashioned bureaucracy um, and then um, it's been perhaps rather convenient to blame individuals for the fact that that hasn't delivered change. So in contrast the people with the most freedom, the people who've had cash direct payments um, have often chosen to act not, so, not selfishly but collectively um, so their goals have been individual, but actually without needing that standardizing um, tendency of government to make them do roughly the same thing. People have actually found that their conception of a good life all looks fairly familiar, looks fairly similar. It's been about forming friendships, it's finding somewhere to belong, and it's feeling useful to others. So many on the left, I think, do continue to believe that giving individuals control, individual control over state resources, always leads to consumerism and competition for scarce resources. I'm sounding rather similar to Liz here, but it's too late to rewrite it now, so um, you just have to bear with me. And as, as, a, as a result, I think, the left um, can be typically reluctant to devolve power too far to the level of the individual, because then you're into the, the rights territory of free market forces and so on. Um, what we've seen you know, through the personalization reforms, um, imperfectly delivered and implemented and in, in many cases mangled as they've been, is a glimpse of people's innate desire and ability um, to act collectively. And their power when they do that, not just to change services, but actually to change whole communities. So the state has a vital role in this. But it's not a role that's about organizing or standardizing, as to pick up on the phrase in the original relational state um, report. Um, it's to help people to self-organize. For some, that role needs to continue to be fairly assertive and fairly interventionist. And you can see that actually in shared lives, um, uh, which is typically for people who have personal care needs, often for people who have been very isolated, perhaps lived long times in uh, institutional care. Um, and it's a regulated service. It's a partnership between uh, a commissioner, usually the council, often actually provided by the council in terms of the, the local scheme, um, the regulator, um, and the individual. But it's about creating just enough space so that people, um, the shared life carers, their families who, who, who get involved, and the person who's receiving support can create whatever family life feels like to them. But in the security of knowing there is a backup, there's a plan B if things don't work out. It's not simply a question of, of, of state stepping back and hoping for the best. So um, I think what, what we need to, to, to kind of gain from, from those different models of individual control is the idea that actually we have to start from the assumption that there is a shared responsibility, that we all have a shared responsibility for, for our own lives, but also for the outcomes of public service interventions into our lives. So, yes, we should be connecting and deepening, but the challenge isn't actually connecting services up with each other. It's connecting services with the rest of people's support ecosystems. Um, those ecosystems which can be really, really vulnerable and really fragile, and actually it's easy for services inadvertently to, uh, to trample over. If we just connect services as they stand, we might actually just simply consolidate those services' worldview, which can be very deficit-based. And it's a view in which people are services recipients, um, at best their customers, but not their workers, their planners, or their owners. Um, so any personal resource allocation that's based on me as a, a bundle of needs is going to miss my strengths and my capabilities and the relationships which are most important to me. Whereas if we have the opportunities to control state resources, but also the support to act collectively in small groups, there is then the opportunity to move from being commissioner uh, to be, sorry, to move from being consumer to moving to commissioner, i.e. somebody who actually shapes their services. And that's the deepening of relationships, which I think will bring real change. So it's not just about professionals um, having a more complex view of people's needs, but also recognizing that shared responsibility and that potential. You can see that very obviously in the direct payment holders, who are essentially now running their own small care businesses, their own personal support system. But we need to extend that principle of co-ownership to everybody who is, um, use, who is a regular user of public services, um, even those with smaller or more episodic allocations of state resources to buy support. And we do know ways of doing that. 
Um, so I mentioned one of the microenterprises. We're in touch with about 600 with our sister organization, Community Catalyst. Very small enterprises where people, usually people with direct payments, who've had the freedom to get together in small groups, often with small groups of frontline workers, to develop something which is around what they need, but also it's about what they need to contribute, what they want to contribute to those around them. And I think the, the lessons of doing of what's happened then at a very small scale need to be taken up into that, that larger scale. And I think the most obvious way to do that is the co-op. Um, given that social care is supposed to be about caring and it's supposed to be social, it's very marked that there is no real presence of the cooperative ownership model um, in social care. And actually, particularly if you look for co-ops which are jointly owned by not just frontline workers, but people who use services, that model's pretty much entirely absent. So I'd finish by welcoming that shift down in scale, that idea of deeper connections, but let's have enough trust in people to shift down further to that micro scale and to deepen people's connections with the services they use through ending this endless debate about um, uh, private and public ownership and actually thinking of people ownership as the default model of governance for our service providers. And, and by that I mean the user and, work, and worker-owned co-op um, needs to be much more prevalent in our public service sectors. And actually the tools to do all of this are already there. We've got personal budgets, we've got direct payments, we've got the community right to challenge, the NHS right to request, the Social Value Act. Nobody's tried to join any of these up yet. So we don't want to turn people into isolated consumers left to the vagaries of the free market. Um, but we do need to have a much bigger ambition for much larger numbers of people um, to be supported to form small groups in small places um, because the lesson of shared lives is that that's where good things happen uh, in the small places and also incidentally where Eleanor Roosevelt said that human rights begin. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Alex. Liz, you were nodding vigorously to, to much of that, so there's certainly some agreement here. I haven't heard a, a, so, so strong a, a collectivist argument in favour of individual uh, control over of personal budgets um, before, and that's actually quite refreshing to hear because, as you say, they come under attack uh, from uh, for precisely not it motive. We've got quite a lot of time for questions um, and answers, uh, although that shouldn't be excuse to ask, ask very, very long questions, and I have some questions too, so I might abuse my position in the chair doing that. Um, it's traditional to take them in batches of three and then come back to the panel. You can specify um, who you want to ask, or you can just throw a question and say, oh, there's a hand. Of, we can take them in batches of one if there's only one. Um, oh, no, oh, okay, I've got a lot say. Um, so let's go the gentleman there and then the lady at the back there who happens to know is called Sonia, and this gentleman here who, I don't know his name, but I'm sure it's not Sonia. Hi, um, I'm David, I'm from Unison, and uh, I was intrigued by what you were saying, so you welcome up uh, the idea of relational to public services, I think that's very important. But, um, yeah, a, a little bit, um, I guess, unconvinced about what you said regarding how this could be paid for, uh, and wanted to ask a question about the extent to which, when you say we should devolve power down, um, the extent to which you've considered whether the power to raise taxation locally to help pay for um, more relational uh, public services should be part of the uh, part of the package. Thank you. I've just got a couple of quick questions. First is um, the extent to which you all think that actually labelling um, sort of new paradigms of public service reform is actually that helpful because I guess sort of uh, from a personal perspective after being into working in public service reform I've come to the view that actually to label things like new public management and uh, relational public services and open public services is actually not that helpful because you need to make everything but interested in all your views on that and secondly and apologies I was a bit late because we've already kind of discussed this but um, I think it's quite interesting to probe this question of kind of radical devolution in many ways it's really great but how do you manage the tensions between that and postcode lotteries and one of the strongest things about the NHS is that there's really strong national entitlements there to free care at the point of delivery and that's in strong contrast to social care where there are real kind of strong postcode lotteries so how do you manage that and what's the role of national entitlements and how does that fit in with, uh, uh, with radical devolution? Thank you. Uh, don't, don't forget to identify yourselves oh, as well, sorry, by the way. Yes. And I'm Michael McDonald, head of strategy at NHS England. But I, I, I just wondered why it's still it's still pretty statist. Yes, it's a relational state, and quite a few of the recommendations I just looked at looked quite statist still. And I understand that the big society 
one of its failures was perhaps asking too much of individuals or communities. But there's something in between the, the, the market and the third sector. I mean, the, the, I'm just interested in how you've thought through what sorts of organizations would be the best place to build this kind of company. Hey, um, Rick, do you want to start with as much of, or as yeah. little, well, not as little, yeah, that right some of it, but yes, yeah, some of that. Um, I, I mean, that's a really good point at the end. I mean, we're doing some work now on social care, I and mean, as Alex said about the provider side, this the fact that there aren't cooperative, there aren't cooperative forms of provision and so on, and thinking about how you can facilitate that and promote it uh, and, and build it. Um, so we are interested in diversifying the kind of provision that there is. We are very much interested in that. So um, I, I don't see it as latest. I see it as as sort of um, the state supporting a diversity of providers um, uh, at a more at a, at a more local level to um, to provide provide services. Um, and uh, on this on this question of whether it's helpful, Sonia's thing about the paradigm. I mean, I think it's it's um, as I, I mean as I said when I spoke. Um, this is not um, that we're saying, right, we've had it with, you know, new, there's no room for bureaucracy. There'll be no bureaucracy or there'll be no markets. I mean, um, there very much will be in the areas where they are appropriate. Um, and what, what we're trying to do is say, well, actually, some of, the, some of those techniques have been applied in areas where they don't work. And so we're just trying to find the, the, where, where, is, where is a more relational approach the most effective way of delivering. So it's not about sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. There were many good things that came out of new, you know, falling hospital waiting times and so on. We don't want to let go of all of that. Um, but it's about a shift. Um, and I think it's also important when people talk about, you know, we, we've talked about lots of examples and, you know, we, we've been criticised for trying to corral them together into this rather abstract concept of a, a relational state. I and mean, it's hard to talk about the state without being quite abstract, you know, I mean, because the state isn't sort of an abstract concept itself. Um, but he, but um, it's important for government. I mean, you know, if, if you're a government, it is important to know broadly what direction you're heading in. And I, I think if you look at the, uh, the, the the Gordon Brown administration, for example, you know, that because they because it didn't have a clear strategy on or a clear sense of direction on public service reform, every department just did it its own thing. So I think there is a sort of political use for having some sort of for having a, a sense of direction, um, which can sort of mobilise you know mobilise people behind it. Sorry, can I press you on the point, the gentleman from Unison, though, about the fiscal yeah. side? Not necessarily whether you devolve tax raising powers to the local level, but instinctively, one feels yes, if you have a more preventative relational model, you can, you know, these complex problems might be solved better, it saves money in the long run, because as you say, people don't get into sort of crisis situations which, not wanting to sound too kind of utilitarian about it, but become more costly because people are in a crisis um, and in more extreme circumstances. But have you, that sort of at an abstract level sounds plausible, have you done the maths to say, well actually, you know, this amount of investment in the more relational model, you might yield this amount of saving from the DWP budget? Well, I mean, if you look at what the, where there are, I mean, Greater Manchester, for example, where they have this combined authority, they form the local authority, the club together to form this combined authority, have already um, shown in areas like uh, re-offending and so on that they are, they, they, they are saving money. Um, through these kind of approaches, so it is working. If you talk to Richard Lee from Manchester, he's you know he's very passionate about this because he knows that it's, he, he can see that it's working. So um, there is there is evidence of it happening on on, on the ground um, and, and and real money being saved. So it is a bit. I mean, yes. I mean, people will always say, you know, will will the money actually be saved? I mean, the alternative is just to carry on doing what we're doing now, <laughs> and we know that doesn't work. Because we're just salami slice government departments, and which is going to decimate frontline services. So this is an alternative, um, and I think the emerging evidence uh, on the ground is that it is working. Um, I will start with the Michael's point about two statist and all that. Now, um, it seems to me that most of the, you know, I know people use it, big challenges we face as a country. Okay. Um, we are going to have to help people to take on more of a role and support them to do that. Early years, um, kids in my constituency, on average, starting school at three and a half, are on average 15 months behind developmentally at three and a half. Some in four schools, 20 months behind. Changing that really means looking at the way parents talk to, interact with, play with their children in the early years. You've got to somehow find a way of involving and engaging them. 
at the other end of life, unless people can take on more of a role in keeping fitter, healthier, managing long-term conditions, unless we help families to, to care for the people they love, they do the bulk of the caring, but they struggle and find it a problem, we have to help support them. In the middle, you know, crime and antisocial behaviour, big issue in my constituency. Police can't do that without the help and support of people working in the community. Okay. So we know that people have to take on more of a role, but you can't ask people to take on more of a role if you don't give them more control. Forcing them to fit into a say, you've got to do more and you're going to fit into the service like this. So, but we, we are still struggling to find out how you do that. I mean, that's the truth. We've had rights and responsibilities. We've had the nudge, you know, the whole nudge theory. We've had the big society. We're still very, actually, we don't, we've got some evidence from troubled families, early years, support for family carers, expert patient program, but we've never really understood that and how we make the change happen. Uh, I think it will mean big changes in the way staff are trained. I mean, we criticise doctors and nurses for not helping to empower patients, but if they're never trained with them, with a patient, knowing what they want, how they can be up, how are they supposed to know? So there's big issues there. And I think that this won't work, it can't work, if it is about the state doing things to or for people. Do we have all the answers about that yet? No, we don't but we've got to go there. And that just leads me to my point about, uh, quickly on Sonia, is it helpful labelling something? Look, the truth is, lots of this stuff is happening, but not big enough, wide enough, far enough. Um, so this isn't a total break from the past, but neither is it a continuation of where we are, because we need something bigger, faster, quicker, bolder. And we give it a label partly because, you know, it helps bring attention to the issue and discuss it, which is what we need. And on the final point about the money, um, we do know that you can uh, make better use of resources by the shift to prevention. And you need the pooled budgets to do that. Because if one service spends on the investment, but another gets the benefit of reduction, that's never going to work. So you need it together. But the truth is, um, particularly in the NHS, there's, there's good evidence it makes better use of money. Will it release cash releasable savings? We don't know. Um, but as a friend of mine, who I've promised not to use her name, which I won't, who runs a big mental health service, is doing a trans trying to do a big change in the programme, more care in the community. She's been asked by the chief exec and chair of the board, is this going to balance the books? She says, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I know it will give better better outcomes for people, and it's the only way we can do something differently. But we've got to give it a go. And this is what we mean. We don't. This is about if you give power away and you try something different, it's hard to 100% guarantee. But we as politicians commit we're going to do this, and the media holds us to account for it, and rightly so. But a lot of this isn't going to be simple and clear. So but I, we've got to give it a whirl. Does, does it not follow from that, though, that also you need some political courage and uh, cooperation from the media to an extent in not crying postcode lottery, which was the expression that was used there? We've got a post. I mean, I think the role of the politicians is to say the what, this is the out, this is the sort of outcomes, and and leave it to others to do the how. And you said the NHS people value it, no postcode lottery, but you've got it in social care. That's not my experience of the NHS. There's huge postcode lotteries. So. Um, but this is risky. It, it, it is risky. You know, it's risk giving power away. But we can't. We, we, me, politicians. Uh, you know, there is. Um, we can't micromanage it from Whitehall. We can't. It so won't work. Can I, We've got to just, change. Can I just bring you to the, quickly to the point about fiscal devolution as well? So uh, just that because that strikes me as a slightly different question about the money, but quite an important one. What I would say is, there is no doubt in my mind that the the the, diff the way we've got our tax raising uh, powers already, even, with, even within that, we can get far better outcomes for people with the money that we're spending if we work in a different way. But local councils and the local NHS and the voluntary groups in the schools need central government to change, so that we don't ask people shift to prevention but we pay the hospitals for admitting people. We say pool your budgets but we only give the budgets out 
in silos nationally. There's a lot we can change, and uh, I'm certainly not saying we change the local taxation powers. I think there's a lot that we can do already if we really change the way services work. So before we take another batch of questions, Alex, is there something you wanted to? Um, I was maybe going to pick up on this idea of, of risk, and I think yeah. we, um, because what any change, obviously, we're talking about taking risks, but we, we're often, I think, quite bad at um, being clear about the risks of continuing to do what we do, and, yeah. and you know, most of us would probably agree that it's not so much a risk, it's a certainty of failure in continuing to do what we do. Well um, so, you know, in that context, um, what are the right risks to take? And there's, there's some of this, the, these questions have sort of hinged on this idea of um, the tension between wanting to, to get right down to the individual level so that things are as personalised and as, as um, tailored as possible to make as most sense to individuals. But on the other hand, we don't actually like the idea of people being left at risk as an isolated person, and therefore there's some sense in scaling up. And I think it's perhaps just about, um, to sort of pick up on the NHS example, there are things you do want to do at a very large scale. So if I, if I need... Um, uh, a major surgery. I don't want to be given a personal budget no. and sent out into a marketplace of cottage industry surgeons. I, I really like the, the Indian heart surgeon model where, where somebody's doing a lot of them in a very big building and I'm hopefully in and out as quickly as possible. That makes all kinds of sense. And part of the reason it makes sense is because any choice is likely to be either a false choice or a really quite upsetting choice to have to make because it suggests that actually maybe one of these uh, people that I'm going to get to choose isn't as good as it, the others, and I, I don't really want that choice. I want to know that they're all reasonably good at it. Um, or that I could find somebody who's really brilliant, but actually the, the downside is I have to have the money and resources to travel 100 miles. So it's not a real choice. But if you look at that kind of preventative end of what, what the, the things that actually we should, the, the bulk of the NHS and I would argue most public services should be focused on, which is the health creation and maintenance end rather than the illness treatment end, they can't, those interventions just simply cannot be successful. Um, if they are not a partnership um, between um, the people who are uh, using the service and the people who are providing it. We know that public health um, delivered in a lecture, however well informed a lecture from a health professional, doesn't really make much difference, whereas we do change our behaviour in the context of our relationships with those around us, in our workplaces, in our homes and so on. So we, we've got to be realistic about the extent to what we can hope to do in our current model and the way in which we really do have to, to form those kinds of partnerships with people and therefore take that risk and share that responsibility um, in, in these huge areas of, of which are kind of broadly local prevention. Right, thank you. Now I'm afraid the, the sort of Sotheby's model of gentle nods isn't going to get my attention because of the angle I'm sitting <laughs> So you have to really shove sh your hand up. So this, there was this lady here and then let's go to the lady in the front here and then gentleman at the back there who's just giving me a thumbs up in appreciation. Uh, Maeve McGoldrick uh, from our service history of body for the last and last providers. Um, on page 50 of your report, there's one of the recommendations, the third one, um, uh, for the work programme. I'd just like to sort of test out uh, how you came to the conclusion to have explored uh, alternatives to that. But in this, we're saying that particularly for the hardest to help that the third sector is best place to deliver these programmes. Um, I, I previously came from a third sector organisation called Community Links, we delivered the programme and did a lot of work around deep value of the human relationship. I think that's absolutely key, but I'm not sure when, when we were delivering these programmes, the importance to be able to support the hardest to help was about identifying people's support needs and their assets, as rightly pointed out, equally really important. And then secondly, ensuring that we had the resource available to, to deliver the intensive support that was needed, and that's a one-to-one -one relationship. So I think they're the key attributes to being able to deliver the, the back work support for a, 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 sort of a person very far from the labour market. I'm not quite sure it necessarily has to be sector divided, it's quite the quality of that service. And that's what we, in our position that we stood out in, in my previous organisation, and we can see about across our membership, it's about the quality of that service, of being able to identify the support package that's required and having the resource available to deliver a human relationship because it is very expensive and not everyone on these programmes needs that. Thank you. I'm Josie Fleur. I'm the um, I run the public sector arm of a consultancy called Morehouse. It's a transformation consultancy. Um, my question is about um, so I get if you're going to have a radical devolution of budgets, um, that needs to have a corresponding radical devolution of accountability as well. Um, and I I wondered what the panel's thoughts were on the democratic infrastructure that we need in order to govern the devolution of power and money. Great, thank you. My name's Patrick Hall from the 
the Social Care Institute for Excellence. Um, I wanted to talk, you, you talk about two different types of relationships, the relationship between a service user and a service provider and between service users. I think there's actually a third important relationship that needs to be developed, which is between local professionals. A lot of what you talked about was overcoming service silos and um, organizational culture and different values. Actually, in order to overcome those silos, um, better relationships need to be built on the ground, built around shared values um, and around outcomes for individuals. So I wonder if uh, the panel could comment on Thanks. Reed, do you want to just go to the slight specific point about the work program we can yeah. establish on the case and then maybe yeah. Alex and... Um, yeah, I mean, I, in, the, in, the, um, in the paper, I don't think there's any hard and fast sort of rules you can say, right, only the third sector can do this or only the private sector can do that. I think as soon as you start doing that, that kind of falls apart quite quickly. Um, but I do have an instinct that, um, that um, a lot of the very complex work which is required with the most complex cases um, that a lot of existing community groups on the ground are, are really well placed to do that. Um, and there's been a particular problem in the work program when you, you've had private providers coming in who don't have the existing relationships and then they have to establish them all from scratch, you know, which I just think is a kind of massive sort of waste of, of time. Now, there are things the private sector can do really well, you know, and, and, and um, you know, certainly in terms of uh, people on JSA, you know, the work program has been, you know, working uh, much better in those areas. So um, I think that um, I'm not going to draw any sort of hard and fast rules, but I think, uh, you know, the most complex cases where you want to work through existing local relationships and so on, there's lots of community groups out there that would do that really well. And all I'm saying is do the commissioning locally for those kind of things so that those groups have an opportunity to, to bid for these contracts. The problem at the moment is the contracts are so big that they don't get a they, they don't they, they can't get get in through the door. So that's so we just want a, a, a sort of level playing field if you like so that those smaller organizations can um, can get involved. Do you want to pick up on any of them? Yeah, just on that sector sort of issue, actually. So I, I was talking about microenterprises, and, and most of the microenterprises are effectively the private sector because they're too small to constitute as a charity or a kick. Um, but they, by, by organising on a very small scale and being highly embed, embedded in their communities, they're able to do some of those sorts of things that the third sector, um, um, you know, part, part of the third sector organisation sometimes rather glibly talks about being its kind of territory in terms of mm -hmm. relationships with people and uh, kind of connections to communities and so on. And um, I think it's it's hard to escape the fact that there are um, now um, not, you know, quite a number of charities out there which probably feel just as distant to people who receive their services as some private sector organisations feel. And I think we probably as a sector um, are really um, nervous about talking about that and get really quite cross when anybody um, uh, talks about it. So maybe somebody's going to get really cross now. But um, I, again, I would come back to this, the, the key thing being shared ownership. And actually, is um, the charity structure for a really big public service contract delivery organisation the right structure to, to ensure shared ownership? Or is the co-op better, for instance? Yes. Um, I'm going to start with Patrick's point about um, bringing teams of people together. I mean, the, the best examples of genuinely joined up services are where people do almost physically work together in a same environment as a team, so or at least have very strong relationships. So the hospital doctor knows that if he discharges an elderly person, there is going to be someone back at home to do the home care, the having the someone to come around, pop in and help with the shopping, that the occupational therapist is there to help sort out the home and the physio's there, and that they know and trust each other so that they really understand different people's skills. I think we need to have a, a really serious look at how this, in the jargon, multi-professional training goes on, because if you're trained separately and you don't really understand what different people are doing, it's, I mean, it, it's hard to bring that up. But the most powerful change has been, has been when they start as teams with the person, and they don't say, what do you want from our service, but what do you want to live your life? So when we went to the Leeds uh, Neighbourhood Networks with IPPR, as part of their Condition of Britain report, they start by saying, what do you want to live your life? And somebody might say, I just want to be able to pick up my grandchild. Or 
I love sitting in the park. I'm so sick of being stuck in here. Um, or I love the footy. I just can't get there and I'm too nervous in a big crowd. So, and that changes services around. I mean, it's little wonder we all struggle a bit to, you know, you've got to get your cholesterol down to this or your blood pressure down to that, rather than if you knew, you said, I want to get to see the footy, you might really make the changes you need to yourself to actually make it. So I think it's not just about the professionals. And this links to Joseph's point about um, uh, making it happen in accountability. I think you've got, we've got to measure what matters to people not to individual services and we do have to hold services to account for that rather than you know I think targets did a lot of good bringing waiting lists down and all the rest of it but now I, I think Hillary Ben said the other day when we left there was something like 1,200 targets for local councils I mean you can't have a target for everything you do need that accountability I'm quite keen that the health and well-being board on the health side is quite a powerful mechanism for that in councils but the most important thing is you've got to measure what matters to people. Okay, let's take a, another batch of questions. Gentleman with the uh, flagrant biro, a uh, lady in the blue top there, and then behind her, the gentleman in the red top. And then let's take you as well, madam, because that was everyone. So, so we, we thought it's time. The rules, rules can be bent. I'm uh, Paul Hodgkin. I uh, set up a patient thing, which is not what the website where people can share stories about the health service and social care. My question really is about the cost of these drivers, because the cost of markets is static or rising, the cost of bureaucracy is static or rising, the cost of partnership working is static or rising, the cost of individual budget is static. The thing that has dropped through the floor is this stuff, is voice. Yeah, okay. exactly. And it's relatively not represented in this. And it's mm -hmm. a massive drive. So my question really is for Liz, yeah. in terms of how do you see social media in its widest sense, I'm not talking yeah. about Twitter and Facebook, mm -hmm. it's its widest uh, in, and it's, it's relation to the state, really, because yeah. we, we have a pretty troubled relationship with the state in terms of what is the patient opinion. And how do you do that stuff in a way that allow voice to happen? Um, Kat Wall from the New Economics Foundation. Um, we're doing some work at the moment on uh, what a new social question might look like uh, going forward. And one of those uh, one of the elements of that is envisaging what the welfare state might mean. Um, obviously, this work is incredibly important. Ideas. So the current welfare state model is a mix of both public services um, and the social security benefits, cash transfers, mm -hmm. if you like. And I was just wondering what the role of those cash transfers or benefits are in the relational state model. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alistair Howard, um, I work for Streetlight.com. We are a local social network that connects people in their community so they can have conversations. Um, we have over 100,000 users in 2,000 communities across Britain um, and have really focused on, over the last few years about getting people signed up, talking to each other and solving each other's problems. Mm -hmm. um, we find it quite difficult to engage with government, councils and any sort of institution who may be able to support and directly interact with our users, many of whom are doing things like coming together to floods, get, um, get older people online and, and really address the needs of their community. We find that generally it's a lot easier for people to just talk about an idea or maybe suggest their own platform they're going to build and the hard bit of getting people using it is something they conveniently then talk about. But how do you see organisations actually stepping up and putting the work in to engage organisations like us and our users rather than just seeing that as the difficult bit and just talking yet another platform which anyone can get someone to build and just ignoring actually making it effective. Right, thank you. And then yeah, hi, I'm Caroline Abrahams. I'm the charity director of AGK. And um, I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, one of the things I like the best is that I've, I've always thought that really the purpose of services should be to create the best possible environment to support a really good relationship between the person delivering the service and the person receiving it. Um, so it's been great to hear Liz in particular say some things about how people are recruited and trained mm -hmm. uh, because in the end that seems to me, I mean I agree with Alex, I think the voluntary sector is perfectly capable of delivering bad services and sometimes does. But what matters most is the person actually doing the delivery. Um, and from that point of view, really this is a question for Liz I think, are you, are you prepared to really put some thought and time into workforce planning, training, yeah. improvement? Oh. And yes, I, say I think you can see lots of the 
lots of frontline staff as on your side. I think they, I yeah. think they don't like what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They came, came with a job to do a great job, and so my plea to you really yeah. is to view Works. them as on yeah, your yeah. side and to alongside actually the people who are mm. trying to help. Don't think. Well, that, all of that was directed to you. Can I dive in? So you're, um, you're on, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I think this is. Uh, let's start with Caroline about workforce issues. Um, I went to a, a brilliant visit in uh, Worcester recently, where their university is doing some quite brilliant stuff on dementia. And the thing about dementia is that uh, you're never going to get dementia care right unless you essentially talk to the people with dementia but also crucially their families because if you have dementia and you forget things or you can't express yourself uh, you need the families to help explain what it is that the person is used to likes for food sleeping time to get up because it's when they're forced in, anyone's got anyone in their family with dementia that different environments make people very agitated and nervous and stability and routine is quite important but how are you going to know about that care unless you talk to them and what they were doing in Worcester was the uh, patients, people with dementia and their families interview people being nurses they're on the panel to decide are you ready they develop the courses help develop the courses so this is what we're going to be training you on and they actually help provide the course, talking about their experience. So that really the future workforce is being trained to understand really what people want and need. So that is an example of how I think, as I said before, you, 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 you blame blaming people when A, they're working in a system that doesn't function properly, but B, I mean if you're a if you're I mean I only started because now I'm the you know ripe old age of 42 and have started seeing it in my own family, but also as an MP, I had never met a 90-year-old with horrific dementia. I, I didn't know what it was like. So how can you expect people starting out in the system? So, so that's very important. And on this point, I briefly mentioned this stuff at the beginning, um, uh, uh, Paul, but because I saw you there, I didn't want to shamelessly use all the stuff you told me before, which is what was the figure you gave about... If we thought this was investment in public sector infrastructure, how much money is in this in this country, did you tell me that time? Okay, the, the NHS invested ten billion in connecting health, and over that same decade as citizens we, we invested at least a hundred billion. Okay. In this stuff. What if we thought that this as part of the investment in our skills infrastructure, our health infrastructure? Um, and it's not just about accessing emailing to set up your appointments or whatever it is about personalizing it to you we it's weird we I mean I do now even though I'm not a whatever it is native I'm a what's the expression when digital you're a, immigrant. I'm a digital immigrant but you know I'm starting to feel a bit more native but my life is on it but somehow on public services it's completely separate mm -hmm. and I want to give an example of that where, where I think it's better for people and saves money I've got a brilliant youth services in my constituency. I'm so sorry, I will try and keep it short. Uh, um, we're not no longer really doing it mostly through the local council and the boring old youth centres that nobody ever wanted to go to. Um, Street Vibe and Soft Touch, small voluntary organisations, work with young people who decide what is it we fancy doing and when. And then the young people, they organise it via Facebook. So what happens is, it's not the boring old youth centre, it's 11 o'clock at night, um, packed with kids doing, uh, this makes me sound sorry, street, like a riot. Street, so <laughs> street, street dancing and parkour, you know, when you leap over stuff. Right, this is what I mean about risk. Still the poor local riot, council person there looking terrified. There'd be a <laughs> health and safety incident. But it was rammed with people. So there's no such thing as hard to reach if you do stuff you want in a way that people can organize it themselves and the very interesting thing for me there where it was a sexual health nurse from there it's 11 o'clock at night in Braunston and she you know in the background just there to provide information she said oh god I did not want to do this I wanted to be in my nice sexual health clinic 9 to 5 in the hospital oh, I've got to go out there at 11 o'clock on a Friday night she said but now I'm here I'm seeing the people I need they're coming to see me 
this is how, and that is why I am, it's difficult, but it's possible, and I'm very optimistic. Rick, can I direct you towards the, the question about um, tr cash transfers, and mm. because we haven't touched on that yet. Yeah, that, was the, that was a really hard question. Yeah, that's, um, why, that's why, why I avoided it, yes. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, okay, three, three things about that. One is, um, obviously, on, in terms of the, the, the welfare system, I mean, that is, if you like, the sort of most standardised bit of the system. So it, it's less relational, and quite rightly so. You know, there, are elig there, are, there, there should be universal eligibility criteria for, for benefits and, and, and so on. So, um, so there's an element, a big element of standardisation there. But there is, but we do need to think about the way in which people interact with, um, with the benefit system in particular and that, what that does to people and, you know, how disempowering it could be. I mean, this government talks about empowering people. Um, now, I, I think it's right that there's conditionality uh, in relation to um, eligibility for, for um, out-of-work um, benefits, but at the, at the same time, um, you know, the sanctions regime which we have, um, I mean, the reason so many people are in food banks and are going to food banks is because, you know, they get their benefits sanctioned for really petty um, missed appointments and all sorts of things, which um, is just disempowering. So we do need to think about the way in which that regime operates, you know, Conditionality is right, but at the moment I think we've got it quite wrong and it, and it, and it disempowers people. And the final thing I would say is that, um, that there is in this concept of the relational state more of an emphasis on building institutions and empowering people to do things for, them, for themselves and less of an emphasis on we're going to give you stuff um, because we think it's good for you. Um, and so, you know, conceptually there's a big shift there, but that, that will feed into government priorities in terms of where you put your money, you know. But we argue here you should put money into children's centres rather than into sort of, um, uh, you know, tax credits and, and, and so on for, for, for childcare. So, you, you, so you're, you're trying to bring people together through the, the way you design the system. Uh, I don't feel obliged to, to pick up on any of that, but if you, there are... Is that a hint? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm um, being so, as relational as I can, it's not a transaction, you don't have to repay them. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to uh, just pick up on Caroline's comment about um, good people um, with the right skills and the right motivation to do a good job who find that they can't do a good job because they're in a structure which simply doesn't allow that. And that has to say that the, the goals um, of both the providers and the commissioners have got out of kilter with what people would consider a good life. So how do we get mm. back that alignment between... Um, uh, what the person at the receiving end wants, the, the frontline workers want. Um, and I think, you know, you, you can look at um, what would happen if some of those services were owned by, um, or where there was genuine shared ownership of, of the people who were using those services and their families. Um, I think we have only just started to explore um, citizen-led commissioning. So we've kind of got user-led organisations, but they tend to have been pigeonholed rather into one particular part of um, civil society. What about um, genuinely co-produced uh, commissioning, where people have um, blank sheet pieces of com uh, blank sheet piece of paper conversations about um, not uh, what should we do with this or that service, but what does a good li life look like and how we're going to get there? I think those sort of things would start to change some of that culture. And finally, I think the, the care bill um, uh, does something really quite interesting, and it's not the bit that everybody is interested in, which is all about Dilmot and, and all of the new duties on councils. The most interesting bit is Clause 1, um, which says social care is going to be all about delivering well-being, and then it goes on to define well-being so broadly and holistically that no service um, of any kind could deliver it, and certainly couldn't deliver it on its own. So in other words, it takes the goal of this public service sector well into the territory which services can't deliver on their own. Um, and I think that could that, that, that definition of well-being about active family life, active community life, could work as a definition for all public services. And I think if we did have a single goal for public services that was aligned more closely with what we would all, um, given five minutes, be able to agree, roughly speaking, a good life look like, um, that might help to align things back to, to people. Great, thank you. Any more questions for another answer? Gentlemen at the back, um, and if there's no one else, then I've got one. So, yes. I'm Max Tom. I work for an adult social care charity. I had a question about this point about public services bringing people together. And I suppose one of the things that strikes me is some public services sometimes are okay at doing that some of the time when it's peers. So people who are maybe bringing new mothers together, someone who has something in common. It strikes me it's much harder to bring people together who maybe don't have so much in common. So someone who's long term out of work. They don't have weak ties, not people who help them into jobs, it's actually quite hard to maybe introduce them to those people. 
plotting it for those people. You might have seen the same thing about using stigma and breaking down those barriers. A number of those complex problems you were addressing at first. I suppose your answer would be, well, we need new institutions. Uh, I suppose my question is, what's the quality of those institutions that can bring people who are quite aware of their differences together, make them for common purpose or other reasons? Okay, thank you. And um, I have a question for you, Liz. I knew you were going to um, say. <laughs> sorry, but I was very interested in this, this point that there are front line people on front line delivery who actually uh, would be on your side with this. But, um, on the um, my question is about the politics of this because the reality is, if you imagine a Labour government coming in and wanting to do some of this stuff, there will I can confidently forecast be people who will say. But what you're doing here when you say, how was it described brilliantly, turgid brew of quasi-markets and bureaucracy. <laughs> the people who are currently delivering a turgid brew of quasi-markets and bureaucracy <laughs> are, in quotes, our people. And what you're saying is they are inadequate or they're not doing it properly. And although that isn't what you would be saying, that the politics of it are going to get you into that space very quickly. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you see that playing out in the next couple of years. Um, I think that all of this stuff that we've talked about, although I'm hugely passionate about it, I think many people uh, working in the public services, and David, where's David, he's still there, he's from Unison, there he's gone, you know, people just go, oh God, you know, not, not more, not more, um, and they will feel like they've been under huge pressure, they'll feel it's yet more change. Um, I think people will be worried that, hang on a minute, isn't this just, you know, we'll be distrusting. And I think it is difficult because you're both wanting to say things need to change, but you're not saying that people in the, in the system are bad people doing bad things. They are... Um, faced with a system that isn't helping. I mean, my experience, the vast majority has been that people are desperate. They go into public service to, to give something back and do some good in society. The system hasn't worked, but they're distrustful of politicians because they think, rightly, well, you've, you've never done it. You don't know what it's like. You don't understand our lives. You say you want change, but I'm just overwhelmed with what's happening. And I, there are different approaches. There are the kind of My, Michael Gove, I'm, and, and to some extent Tony Blair, I'm taking on the system. Um, there's another approach which is just we know it's all very difficult and we'll help you. And this balance between challenge and setting the direction but bringing people with you is very difficult. But we have to make change because people need different services and the public finances demand it. Um, we need some good incentives in the system, I think, which help people work in the right way rather than what people are annoyed about is, you tell us to do this, but the way you pay it, the financial incentives or the structures force us, so what are you asking us to do? So I am, I have to be hopeful in politics that we can, we can find a way through. But it will, I've no doubt it will be tough, but we have to do it in a different way. Rick? Yeah, I mean, I think, of, well, I mean, there's, there's some examples in the report, actually, of, of, of systems, the um, school system in Ontario, where they took a very, um, where they were, they did post challenge to the teaching profession there, but they also provided support, and they did it in a, in a quite a non-judgmental way. They didn't go around sort of bashing it around people's heads in the way that Michael Cove uh, does, you know, sort of defining himself against the profession. Um, but saying, look, you know, we're going to support people to try to improve it. And actually, if you look at London Challenge here, that was an improvement program that did challenge schools who weren't doing so well. Mm -hmm. But it actually mobilised the profession. I mean, people got very attached to it in the profession, had a very positive view of the program. So there is, um, I think there's a, there's a there's an art to doing this, which is not as confrontational as some people. Can I just come back on this point here, which is when um, so we also when, have to deal when with the staff, question about yeah, when when, when staff down. here the politicians saying this is what people want. They see it as political, I understand. But where if you really start with a person using the service and you hear what they say, that is the way, that's what I mean about us, politicians having to give away power. Because if we say people want X, Y and Z, uh, it's much better if the pe 
They don't need us to say that. People need to hear. I'm so I've forgotten the other question. What it was, was it? about bringing people together easily enough when it's um, sort of um, mum, yeah, new institutions and what the uh, other qualities of an institution that will actually have the capacity to bring people together, possibly quite hard to reach people. I mean, I, I mean, I, th I think on that one of the most interesting. We did some work a couple of years ago asking people. Uh, in sort of you know talking about the big society and sort of saying to people, well, what 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 kind of things would you be willing to do in terms of co-producing services and help support? And actually, the most popular thing that came out was mentoring a young person who was um, struggling, who was falling behind at school, um, and that was about people. Um, I think mentoring young offenders also came pretty high. And that was about people saying, actually, you know, I would be willing to go. I mean, people saying they'll do it and actually doing it, as we know, it's very different. But it was interesting, that was the top thing. And that was about people coming together, often with someone quite different from them. And there's lots of really good examples of that. So I think, um, actually, you know, we do, you know, there's a role for politicians, there's a role for um, community leaders and so on in trying to mobilise people around this idea that actually, um, you know, lots of people do it already, you know, spending some time outside, helping someone outside of their own family, you know, that's the thing. It's sort of, and, and, um, uh, and I think, you know, mentoring people who are uh, mentoring young offenders or, or, or mentoring people at, at school, and so, so sometimes um, you, you might need, this is where it's different from a big society, you might need an intermediary to organise that, I mean, that's the thing. You can't just sort of say, we think it would be a good idea. The problem with a big society is like an aspiration without a strategy, you know, because they don't like stuff. You know. Governments don't like strategies and plans because it's, it's, kind of, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of planning. And I think it, it's ignored um, 30, 40 years of um, community development work, which actually knows it's not so mysterious. I mean, the, uh, I think Lord Way was quoted as saying it will always be mysterious, but actually there's been, if you look at the Chicago asset-based community development um, Institute, they've got a really good evidence base, and you know, people in this country and all over have been doing that. Um, and I, I think a good example of, um, uh, of, of an approach that, that tries to take those, that has successfully taken that, that um, approach is local area coordination, um, which Western Australia and now a chunk of Australia has been using to try to um, completely reform the idea of social care. So, a local area coordinator is somebody who's very patch based, they're very, sort of, I think, what we would describe as ward level. Um, and there's somebody with an open door, um, so the first thing that they're, they're going to do is not ask you, are you needy, poor and vulnerable enough to be my problem? They're going to have a, a, you know, a remit to talk with you. Um, they're not there primarily to assess you, they're there to help you plan. Um, and they um, are sort of on the margins of the state with state support and a route into service land when they need it, but that isn't their, their role isn't signposting. And I think we have, we made the mistake that we think things are preventative when actually they're often just a funnel into, into services which aren't necessarily what people need. And so a local area coordinator, um, say working with an isolated older person, is not going to try and do an assessment first of all. What they're going to do is try and get to know that person at quite a deep level and understand what life looks like now, what they would like life look, to look like, and think about all the ways in which that person might achieve that life with services there but tending to be at the bottom rather than the top of the list. And where it kind of moves away from that sort of um, cross your fingers and, and hope sort of model of community um, building is that if they find that um, there isn't anybody around for you to connect to um, in your community, there is then that, that community development remit. And I think what we need to be getting into the habit of in terms of testing whether any public service intervention is cost effective or not is it, if it's cost effective, it's going to have left people better connected, <coughs> better informed and more confident um, to, to manage their own support. And those three tests aren't just prevention tests, they're actually tests that, that any public service intervention at any stage of need can apply. Great, thank you. Right, well, we are, it says here I have, um, I'm supposed to get the panel to sum up, but um, unless they have something pressing to get off their collective yeah, chest. So one final. And Sorry. You do? Um, you surprise, surprise. Um, no hesitation. I would say that this conversation here I don't mean to use this as therapy, but feels so very different to what happens in the big picture political debates in Prime Minister's questions or developing a pledge card or all of that stuff. And I think this is a profoundly challenging debate, discussion issue for the way we do politics. Uh, I think the role of politicians, we haven't really grasped yet what it needs to be if we're going to make this work because we have to change the old ways that we do things 
and it's hard with the me. I wouldn't ask the media to change. It's up to them to do what they they do. No, I, I, but I entirely agree. In the way that this we is very this. very different. They, they uh, you know, imagine <laughs> having a Q and A with Paxman on Newsnight about what have you? How many are you going to have? How many communities? Or, what, or whatever it is. And this is the thing I take away from this: is we have to do central <coughs> politics and central government very differently if we're going to make this happen. Locally, I don't know quite how to do that, so that's my. I'm yes. going to go away and think. Thank you for making me think. That's that's what I wanted to say. Is my last point. Oh, that's a, a, a perfect note on which to end it. So I can't really add anything to that other than to say thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Thank you, IPPR. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>